Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Red Wheel Battle Poetry Society. Welcome, Ken. We are delighted to have you read for us this evening. Um, in terms of how we will proceed, so can you you can read for about 45 minutes or however long you plan to read. Um, and then we usually have an opportunity for some questions or some comments, that sort of thing. And, and you can just maybe indicate to me in the chat if you're keen for that, but there's absolutely no pressure. We we do like that part of the, of the session though, um, the juicy bits. But yeah, um, without any further ado, Ken is a established, well-respected fiction writer. Um, I, I know some of your novels um, and I'm happy to, to, to hear some of your poetry today. I don't know if you're going to introduce the text for us, but that's completely your choice to make. Thank you, Ken, the, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Carolina. I see we are very small house. I heard on the radio today um, that, uh, guys, can you see me, by the way? Caroline, can you guys see me? Yes, yes, we, we can see. Oh, good. I heard on the radio the other day that it's Van Gogh's um, birthday. And um, I think he's a patron, patron saint of artists um you know who, who weren't very successful and in fact part of that story i heard on the radio is that uh, his mother threw away a hell of a lot of his paintings now after he shot himself um his sister-in-law collected what was left so um i feel a bit like van gogh where <laughs> maybe I'll, my poems will sell for seventy thousand dollars when i'm dead but anyway that's beside the point um Okay, my, my journey began, no, I can't say that. My writing journey ended about, it started ending about 10 years ago when I got involved in photography and I was completely, completely obsessed. And um, I, that energy shifted uh, into the visual, but I always felt there was something missing. And um, I, I, wanted to write, but I didn't feel there was a book in me anymore. And eventually I found my way into writing uh, poems in relation to some of my pictures. So this collection, I mean, this uh, presentation will be uh, acrastic, meaning that it will be about pictures that are in relationship to, um, to poems or poems that are in relation to pictures. This is the first one. It's called Revision. I've put literature aside. I've done with writing, a tired divorce from a vicious wife. I take photographs now, the camera decides what new things might happen. Often they do, a surprise, a joke unexpected. Next year, I'll be a prophet, a saint of originality. It's in the light. I can't see clearly, in the vague clouds of hope. No one knows what joy tomorrow will bring, what pranks the masked sensor will spring. Next year, I'll be a photographer. My cameras are expensive. This one is called Plumbago. It was inspired by John Eppel, the, the absolutely wonderful Zimbabwean poet, but also inspired by my wonderful life partner, Henri. She shows me Plumbago in the dusk. My glasses off. To me, it is a gentle blur, but I would recognize it anywhere. Years have softened the carnelian edge, the bright pat flesh that never bled. The plumbago poet on the tropic page reminds me what we've known so long, but seldom said. That plumbago, that plumbago poet was John. I was talking a while ago to some poets about what a sonnet is and isn't. And one of them was struggling to write sonnets. So I wrote this one in response. It's called About Other Sonnets. The prototypal sonnet is a dream. Each bar two beats and five bars to a line. Yet trouble comes with such a rigid scheme. For tongues are quick and words might be too fine to bind within this limited array. What Shakespeare did was stagger and invert giving rhyme ease to stalk and play above the ground of stolid marching feet. 
with run-on lines and argo sweet, he freed the form from rules that shackled all and troubled it with living grace. Now poets bleed to match his art in scope, though their work doubled. If this is wrong and to me proved, I never wrote, nor no poem ever moved. Walking with a jeweler. As I climbed with the jeweler on a fanboss mine, his eye is drawn in and down by tiny gears of seed and bloom, by radial and bud, by pod and wall, by fractal tongues that swell and will fail. The loop he wears is ground of thought, polished sheer by mental sight. Now I shall attempt to put a picture on the scene and relieve you of my face. Host, disabled participant, screen sharing. Host, can you do something about that? Yes, so just give me one second. Apologies. Sure. Yeah, you should be good to go, Ken. Let's do uh... Yeah, share screen. Okay. Um, there we go. Uh, are you seeing a leaf on a table? Caroline, are you seeing a leaf on a table? Hello? No, no, there's nothing yet. I think it might have something to do with. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Great stuff. All right. It's called the name of a leaf. A dry brown leaf crossed the light slanting on the floor and split its shadow dicotyledonous, elongated. It wasn't clearly brown in this light, more leather and seed husk, an umber hum or coil of sandalwood smoke, a small but withered, uh, sorry, a small and withered but hard form cello music and the rent of light that tore through the shadow didn't smile or speak, though it tried to mouth. If only it would slow things down, slow down more, slower, slow enough to think its name aloud. Uh, are you seeing the picture or are you seeing me? Um both, but yes, we see the picture. Okay. Are we seeing the picture? Air ripples under pinions. Do you hear it? And through them along the spread wingtips, flexing hollow quills sweetly, mooning songs that the broad armed spoonbill transcribes in the angle of his flight. The geometry of its language, the holy book of movement. My echo of the bird is gone now. Only a diagram remains, printed on this rectangle. Still, I listen, not well enough, hoping to hear. Three haiku are seen in flight, seeking pages in which to incarnate. They were souls of birds that died of fire or drowning, and one fell to claws. Turned into thoughts, they rest in stillness, not too far above the water. Still night with boots. About to leave her flat with regret. She left her posh boots on a deep sill to gather black light and then spill it, as only the gloss of patent leather does or glass, emptied of the owner, they wait. This one is time piece. A soft, sweet horror log, unlike the one in Prague that calculates the stars. In this one, Venus kisses Mars. This is the one in Prague that calculates the stars. Have you been there? This is my single attempt. Um, no, 
Not yet. I'll go back to Bob. This is called a drunk scholar. A drunk scholar contemplates the clean evening air. An ibis calls, its voice violent and uneven, like a maddened clarinet. His two friends read in silence, and the neighbors interrupt other chatting birds with horn-like tones, and then fall away for a while before scribbling into more speech. He drinks peak and stream named after nuts and water, ill-fitting the good white wine it is. The scholar decides he is a fool, his whole life condensed. The waves murmuring from the beach into this moment. Someone walks clumsily into the kitchen, feet thudding on Oregon pine as the oven struggles with its arthritis, its hypertension, its pinched nerve, its asthma to roast this God-anointed lamb. But he is glad to have led such a pure life. Back to Prague, sorry. This is called Easter Hunt. I live in a number of empty homes, moving from one to another, when a wall collapses or rain bursts through broken pain, or strong tentacles of water pry open the roof. I speak in crowded buildings, thinking to be heard before the day is over. I have my sandwich box, the same one I took to school. There are no shared meals. It is hard to know what resonates, what lands. There is no measure of impact. Outside, adults hunt for Easter eggs in a humid garden. The clouds are luminous, sun glares through. Such elation, chocolate marbles may be found melting in the self center. At last, we get to my brain. There's a picture of my brain. It's also my first and last attempt at um, a rap called Brain Selfie. I'm like Angel Michael, I'm cutting my image from stone. This is my brain, yo, set free from my skull bone. This is my brain, smiling at you. It's made out of stone, yo, always new. ecstatic one. Oh, she prays for rain, for ascension to life, for release from stone. The next poem was written by, was written about COVID. And I'm glad I don't have a picture for it because it's utterly horrible. It's called Song for Children. Oh, the careless guest who torched the house and left some dead before he fled. The rats in the roof play tit for tat. Beware the cat, I'm a rat, rat, rat. The rats in the roof play tit for tat until the break of day. Oh, the careless guest who touched the lung goes some to hang as he watched and sang. The bats in the roof can scratch their crotch, scratch, 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 and scribble, scribble, scrabble. The bats in the roof go scritz, scritz, scritz all the livelong day. Oh, the careless guest who stole our air and made some gasp in pain, pain and fear. The squirrels in the roof, some break birds' legs and eat the eggs and leave them drakes. The squirrels in the roof, they break birds' legs all the livelong day. I think I'll calm it down. Calligraphy. Nature brushes a poem. Oh, let me switch off this thing. You might be seeing it. Okay. Nature brushes a poem with perfect imbalance using surface tension, color, and wind. The craftsman foolishly struggles to frame it. In the next in the next poem, I have a sort of debate between the metaphor and the, the image. Are you, sure, are you guys sure you can see the image? Caroline, you see the image? 
Every, everything is good on our side. You see the image? Yes, good. yes, yes. Oh my God, I had a moment of anxiety. Okay, sacred fruit bats, in which um, the poem argues between the metaphor and the reality. A carolin of fruit bats ring to heaven and makes the morning sun burn with pleasure. The sun rises up at the touch of their leaven while people forget their search for treasure. Materialists say they're actually bray. The bats are really secular idlers. How can these give a morning joy? How can one get the real measure? The soul of euphony demands solution. Two creatures can't be either neither. Thus my poem can't reach conclusion. Must dangle here at tortured leisure. Now the next one um, is a prose poem that began with a dream. Okay, it's called Living in the Forest. When we lived in this house in the forest, we kept a canary. Its own house was a simple perch in the corner of the balcony. We kept it tied there by means of a delicate silver chain. It would sometimes fly straight up to the limits of the chain, nearly a meter, and hover there until it grew tired and then had to come down again. We fed it seeds and a heaped teaspoon of a creamy porridge, which was strangely nebulous, lacking clear definition. It would only eat the porridge in the air while hovering at the limit of its chain. We decided one day to release the bird, it flew off, but soon came back and stayed with us for some months. As it flew about freely, its wings grew more colorful and varied, boasting shades of chartreuse, both yellow and green. They also grew in number, though you couldn't see clearly through the blur of speed. Sometimes it looked like a six-winged butterfly. Eventually, the canary left us, which we just had to accept as a fact of life. Then our bird returned. It was very different in appearance, and I wasn't sure if it was the same one. It was bigger. Its wings had simplified again to two, and they had crimson flashes along the upper surface. One morning, the canary flew down to my wrist and forcefully clamped those red flagged wings about it. Sometimes I felt that I was wearing a bird-headed bracelet or watch, a living one. Sometimes I felt that it had become part of me. I'm older now. We abandoned the house years ago. Is the bird still tied to me in some way I don't understand? I cannot know for certain, but I have my suspicions. Let me go back to the bird. Kate Sidley um, posted in Facebook something about um, some form, some poetic form on uh, elements, like it was a sonnet or something. So I said, how about writing a villanelle about elements? She said, go for it, Ken. So I did. And that led to a, um, that led to a Facebook page called the Villanelle Challenge, which attracted some interest. And this one is on Quicksilver. A dentist gave me pills of mercury that rolled and melded on my palm. I think of it as childhood's treasury, not knowing that it was an augury of long potential toxic harm. I still think it childhood treasury. A dentist gave me pearls of mercury Silver quick, a liquid psalm that gave no sense of bodily usury, a claim against my body's, my body's treasury that rolled and melted on my palm. I did not know possible misery. My life has bought me other buggery of quick potential other harm, drink and dacha at our treasury. Though now I call it one bright memory of long lost teeth and childhood charm of silver liquid magic palm I think of it as childhood augury. One more villanelle, if you can endure it. It's sometimes hard to read, especially this one, because the rhythms are weird. It's called In Praise of Boron. I like the thought and sight of boron, though not as blue as copper sulfate, but that's because I am a moron. I know I have to think some moron what to write, declaim, or expiate. Not only because I am a moron, 
The problem is the style of boron that's so obscure and reprobate that poets need to fly or soar on streams of lead and clouds of iron that certainly will irritate anyone who's not a moron. I like the thought and sight of boron, perhaps because it is an exudate of those who pre project much like a moron. I like the thought and sight of boron, yes, not as blue as copper sulfate, though I do not know much more on how it grows or what it feeds on. At last, Ozymandias. You can see the face there. It's called Ozymandias again. Ozymandias by Musenberg dreamed despite his aching head. That deformed clay, once chiseled stone, shows the loss that he begot. His memory is sediment, the wine of conquest, dust. Um, you know, we depend on commas to a great degree. They're very, very important in our writing. I thought I should put the text on because it was really written so that as a textual artifact. It's called Comma Eclipse. After the commas abandoned their post, there was great confusion. It was the last post, declared the older one, though before then they were thought to be ageless. While semicolons, those years as always, struck position, demanded go slow eyed Cassisiera and Tango, demanding knick knock obstruction and release without resolution always forever. And the exclamation marks exclaimed, obviously, and question marks queried, querulous and qwerty, and quotes raised their eyebrows single or double, and the full stops didn't and resisting all movement, it was. An in dash world with an N and M in encode cackle, M dashing all hope in order and progress, motion or meter, while commissidal swaggered or buggered or drunkenly staggered, off, and the worst of them gaggled in atrocious abandon, all, all, and the worst of it, all, yes, cast did strike, just wouldn't or couldn't or didn't give commas on capital a flying head stop. Now, this one is a more restful comment. It called comma. This poem balances awkwardly against my thigh like a hiking stick about to pour. I gaze at a city of green mansions, leaf-starred towers. This, the poem is a selfie of my walk in this forest, not yet taken. I'm still elsewhere, trying to measure the surge of chlorophyll, to weigh its gift of oxygen against my day's dull work. My eyes hungry for clarity. You know, I think that poem's a bit of my, a, a testament for me. This is called a doe in soft rain. A kudu doe in soft rain. Or kidu, sorry, let me start again. A kudu doe in soft rain. Or kid leather or dove suede. Or listening silence. The marching band. This tree, tump, sorry, this tree stump is a marching band blowing flowers out of brass. Its progress is unstoppable. Its chords are succulent. A root toot toot, a root toot toot toot. Its chords are succulent. There's a bit of a bleak one for you. Nothing merry without a child to make the wheel go round. The sky's too cold. The sky's too dull for pleasure to be found. And this one is the reflection. The photograph asks questions. Where does the white sky meet this white lake? What is the color of their embrace? The dark bird is strong in flight, but its image is troubled and breaks into series, broken by the water rippling under it. Sunrise tries to strengthen the wings above, but only lines the edges. The cormorant flies more swiftly now, rising, yet the image keeps pace. It shall not drown. Egyptian goose. An Egyptian goose, brain priest, 
calls the faithless to think on nature. This aging cypress, half deceased, its morbid altar. Now, if you can imagine roses underwater, growing underwater under the sea, you'll be well equipped to deal with this poem. It's called the sea swarms with roses. The sea swarms with roses, their numbers are at my soul. I dream of them at every depth, drifting in the cold. I long to rescue everyone and take them in my hand. I plant, plant them down where they belong on dry land. Jellyfish and rosehip, carnation and clam. The sea's a wicked garden, full of blame. Gull Untitled. I photographed a gull punching a hole in the South Atlantic which took no offense, but reformed instantly with the extreme purity of its craft. And the gull did it again, and so did the Atlantic, and so on. And only I imagined it was hubris. An attempt. He read his own poem in a weak voice, not because he was weak, but because his interest was weak. Not because his interest was weak, but because he was sitting on a soft, deep couch folded over his diaphragm. Not because he was folded over his diaphragm, but because his son was playing pool with a friend and the southeaster was violent and the sun slanted over his shoulder and the waves on the beach surged strongly. Not because of any of these, but because he read his own poem in a weak voice. I think I did that one already. Empty. An empty scallop shell waits for a poem to ride out of the air. Shapes in the sand around it a gesture and hint. Nudge, invite. The poem is nowhere to be found. Look at the harsh grain, black stipple, blackened corner of the surrounding frame. See the shell, the curve folding soft pink around blue, sunk in the rectangle in its own labria pit. But there is no poem unless you kneel down and dig it kindly out of the tar. This is my last poem. It's for Philip Wolf. 19 October 1952 to 17 March 2023, and it's called Requiem. This bright boat of Ra travels through webs of cosmos. This guitar, this golden lily pad glows like music on black silence. And underneath, this taste of ancient whiskey rolls on the tongue before death while underneath lost friends who went before reach upwards, like reminders you can't reach, like grasses rippling underwater. Good night, sweet friends. Okay, thank you. That's, that's me. That's my bones. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kim. So I'm open for any conversation, open mic, whatever you do. Fantastic. Um, so I'll just, I'll just stop the recording and then we'll open the floor to some questions and responses. <laughs>